Welcome everybody. My name is Gabriella True and I'm the president of Aspire. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is the week of PANS Pandas Awareness. So this is a perfect lecture for you all to be listening today because it really gives a really wonderful overview of how we got here and what um, is happening up in our body and in our brain. Um, so at Aspire, our mission is to improve the lives of children and adults affected by pans, pandas, and related encephalopathies. Um, we really seek to give tools to empower our audiences. We can't be in the room with all of you um, with the day-to-day -day talking about pans, pandas, so we need to be able to create materials and websites and webinars such as this that um, really digest the information into so like really understandable parts um, for our key audience, which, which is the general public, um, of course, families and patients, schools, and then working with legislators and then supporting providers and researchers. So of course we have our content rich website. We have tons of handouts. Um, sometimes the number of handouts we have may be overwhelming when you first look um, at our website and we continue to do webinars and things like this. Um, and you know, we want to provide support to our families and our adult patients. We have um, our Facebook group and then we do a lot of emails back and forth. Um, and our schools, we spend a lot of times in schools providing in services at no charge, thanks to our wonderful um, donors. Um, we, we've done at least, I don't know, 15 so far this school year. Um, so it's been a busy start, um, but we have time to do more between now and the end of the year. So don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and of course, we work with improving our legislative issues like insurance. Um, we are not the boots on the ground in every state, but we seek to support those that are with state surveys and toolkits and um, state pages. And of course, we're here to provide um, support in ways we can to researchers and our um, different providers. And we do a lot of stuff on the back end that we don't really talk a lot about, sort of like on our social media and our newsletters, um, but there's a lot going on. Um, sometimes it's may seem like the littlest thing, but ends up um, being pretty significant. Um, anyway, so, but we do lunch and learns and grand, help set up grand rounds. Um, we have a few grand rounds that a few doctors on our advisory board are giving in the next few months, which is really great. Um, and of course we have our webinars, we have them in different categories. So, you know, some months we actually do more than one um, trying to make it just sort of one a month more manageable, but we have different um, topics. So just like we have our core audience members, um, we like to bring those members different things that are interest and helpful for them, whether it be behavioral health, integrative medicine, our school support, of course, family and patient support, and our treatment and scientific updates, which is where we are today. So uh, Craig Shimasaki, definitely falls under that category of treatment and scientific updates. He's on the scientific update end. Um, he's gonna talk about, can infections really trigger neuropsychiatric and behavioral disorders, understanding a biological basis for autoimmune attacks on the brain. Um, so Craig has a very rich bio. The entire thing is on this site and here, um, but he is the co-founder and CEO of Molecular Labs, um, a neuroimmunology precision medicine company that's focused on diagnosing neurological, psychiatric, and behavioral disorders triggered by an autoimmune response. So we all know that's one of those is PANS pandas. Um, and, you know, the panel has always been sort of fondly known as the Cunningham panels based off on Dr. Madeline Cunningham's work over the past 20 years um, at the University of Oklahoma Health Services Center. So Dr. Shimasaki has been in the biotech industry for over 35 years, starting his career at Genentech um, as a scientist, business person, and serial entrepreneur, his work spans all stages of research um, and development from bench to bedside. Um, he's done some incredible work with R&D on epitope mapping for an HIV vaccine, SNMP-based genetic breast cancer risk prediction biomarkers, um, rapid influenza diagnostic and therapeutic tools, um, 
And then just on a personal note, it's a great honor for me to have um, Craig here to speak for Aspire. Um, many years ago, back in 2015, I had recently moved to Connecticut and a few friends were like, can you, um, are you interested in helping on a conference? And I was like, I'm a little busy. Um, I got two, one or two kids in a flare and I'm already volunteering for Taka. They're like, yeah, but come on, you can help. And I was like, sure. So next thing I know, I was um, in charge of running the conference and um, the conference was under NPANS. Um, so we were always grateful for their support and Moleculara, thanks to Craig, gave us a small donation to um, get us started because we didn't have anything. Like, I was like, uh, how are we going to rent the space? We need some coffee at least. And um, I'm sure a couple of doctors would like a hotel. So, um, so he sort of uh, helped tremendously. And I think like definitely made the conference a success in part because it gave us a little uh, sure footing as we embarked on the process. And since then, I was the president of the PAMS and now founder, one of the co-founders of Aspire. So I always am so fond of Shim Dr. Shimasaki and he does incredible lectures. We were together last October in Rhode Island at the Family Court um, judge conference and it was a really interesting audience and they were so receptive and his speech lecture knocked it out of the park um so i'm really excited that he is sort of our he is our key lecture and information for awareness day this year um because i know this lecture will really give such a strong basis for um what we talk about on a daily basis on um, pans pandas but really getting into the nitty-gritty of understanding all of the biological basis of it um for pans and other disorders so without further ado i'm going to um stop sharing my screen so that he can share his and get going on what you're really here for because thank you well gabriella thank you for the invitation and i'm looking forward to sharing with your group um, and thank you for all that aspire has done and all that you do here uh, to help patients and clinicians who are working to diagnose and treat these patients that are desperately needing help um, my goal today is to try to cover as much ground as possible uh, i'm i'm going to share a bit about the biology, a little bit about uh, the underlying mechanism of what we at least believe to know uh, that is occurring in uh, these chronic neuropsychiatric uh, autoimmune behavioral disorders, but also it might span a little bit into what we're knowing about long COVID, maybe even um, several other conditions that people are familiar with, uh, and then talk a little bit about the research and the targets that are involved. And then hopefully as this leads to in the future, uh, better therapies that will specifically identify and target these specific routes. Um, so with that, um, I'm trusting you can see my slides okay? Perfect. Okay. All right. So again, the question is, can infections really trigger neuropsychiatric and behavioral disorders? It seems like a uh, sort of an interesting question, but uh, it is one that sometimes stumps and, and kind of... Uh, for an audience that uh, in the medical community that may not have heard or understood about the, these mechanisms, um, I'd like to share with you data and information that might help you either as a clinician or as a parent uh, who was uh, dealing with some of these disorders. Uh, my obligatory disclosures, I am the CEO of Molecular Labs. Uh, we do perform the Cunningham panel, but any data that I'll share today is gonna be from peer reviewed publications that have been submitted to journals and also published and also some that are in manuscript form that's being uh, prepared for publication. The disclaimer is that nothing in what I'm going to say is intended to provide medical or healthcare advice or uh, to deal with an individual medical problem. So uh, the topics I wanna to cover today as uh, efficiently and quickly as possible is that we all know that there's a clinical challenge uh, and the burden of neuropsychiatric and behavioral disorders, but what are some of the things that actually are, are leading or causing or contributing to it? And then question, can infections really trigger neuropsychiatric disorders? Then I wanna to talk to you about uh, a process in biology that's really well known and understood for quite a while called molecular mimicry. 
And uh, this is one of the mechanisms of how infections trigger these autoimmune dysfunctions that result in these neuropsychiatric uh, uh, symptoms. And then why certain infections are more common in patients with PANDAS and PANS, uh, neurologic Lyme or post-treatment Lyme disease, even long COVID. And then I want to briefly talk about how the biological targets that uh, we've identified in what we call now the Cunningham panel can help diagnose and direct therapy, but also be able to help with uh, understand, understanding the underlying uh, root and target the root rather than the symptoms. And then uh, we'll briefly talk in general about some common patient symptoms. What are the general therapeutic categories that have shown clinical effectiveness? in treating these conditions, and sometimes we call this autoimmune encephalopathy secondary to infectious disease. So with that, um, you're probably very familiar, and uh, you may not know, though, that the over 800 million individuals suffer from various neurologic, psychiatric, and behavioral disorders, and this includes PANDAS and PANS, uh, autism, ADD, schizophrenia, bipolar, chronic depression, and the list goes on. So neurologic uh, and behavioral and mental disorders are diagnosed entirely on presentation. So these are symptomatic or clinical symptom diagnoses, uh, not biology, yet they're treated uh, symptomatically and vary, uh, varying responses to treatment, as those of you that know uh, who treat these patients or those of you that know that have patients or, or children uh, or even adults who have been treated. So they're currently diagnosed by symptoms, and I have here just a list of various types of symptoms, for example, uh, in this. So you can see that, uh, let's say, for instance, an individual has motor or vocal tics for more than 12 months. By definition, that individual can be diagnosed with Tourette syndrome because the criteria is uh, vocal or motor tics for more than 12 months. Hyperactivity, difficulty in school, repetitive behavior, as you can see, many of these other different conditions um, would fall into that criteria. Obviously, there's other things that go into this, um, but the bottom line is that these are clinical symptom diagnoses, and even a PANS and PANDAS are also uh, diagnosed uh, by clinical presentation. So they are not uh, an etiologic diagnosis as of yet today, uh, but this is uh, generally the current state of neuropsychiatric disorders. The standard of care for neuropsychiatric disorders focuses on treating symptoms and coping, um, psychotropic drugs, psychotherapy, and then uh, often institutionalization. So uh, one article here, you can see the use of psychotropic drugs among uh, individuals between zero and 17 years is continuing to escalate, as you can see over the years. Um, the other uh, sad fact, though, is that the suicide rate with the use of antidepressants also increases. And uh, it is one, one thing that many of these drugs can be quite effective when uh, used in, in the proper patient who has these underlying um, biological disorders that are related to uh, these drugs that are being used. So another background fact is we also know that organ systems don't operate independently of each other. So our body uh, interacts. We know our immune system interacts with our digestive system. We hear more about the microbiome and how the microbiome in uh, many of these different organisms and commensal organisms contribute to the metabolites and different types of things. We also know that there's a difference in uh, the microbiome in patients who are diagnosed with autism, um, that the diversity of their microbiome is different, and also the, the uh, particular organisms tend to be different. Um, the immune system interacts also with the endocrine system, our hormones, the things that are actually uh, signaling other parts of our body. It also interacts with our nervous system, as we'll talk about more today, also interacts with our integument system. So it brings us to really uh, the advancement in medicine is that the specialization in medicine has been greatly beneficial to understand uh, and, and take care of uh, patients that have these specific types of disorders involved in maybe one segment like psychiatry or immunology, infectious disease or neurology, um, whereas the unintended consequence has been that the integration of these different disciplines 
uh, has been problematic because often what we see in patients that uh, come to us for testing is that they may have seen between five to 15 doctors before they have gotten proper uh, a diagnosis uh, for their condition. Um, so although specialization in medicine has been very important in advancing um, the ability to treat disease, in complex diseases, this is actually, in, in many cases, uh, causing an unintended consequence of referring uh, back to other groups that continue to look for specific things involved in that specialty and maybe not finding it. So the question, can infections really trigger neuropsychiatric disorders? Well, there's a growing body of evidence in peer-reviewed publication, and this is an interesting study in JAMA Psychiatry that was published in 2019. Um, this was a Danish study of over a million individuals that were followed from birth to age 18. So this is a million uh, people that uh, they were followed through their medical records. And what they found was interesting, that if an individual was hospitalized for a severe infection, that the risk of developing mental disorders increased by more than 80% for the diagnosis of schizophrenia, autism, OCD, ADD, ADHD, personality and behavior disorders and other types of disorders. So the question they posed was how could exposure to infections affect the brain mechanistically and give rise to mental disorders? The comment they made was that circulating autoantibodies that enter the brain via compromised blood-brain barrier and bind to neurotransmitter receptors is a potential explanation and this mechanism has been proposed in PANDAS and other mental disorders. And uh, I'll share more a little bit about uh, this is the basis of the blood testing that we do is to look for the circulating autoantibodies that target the brain. So if we step back a little bit, how does this occur biologically, as I mentioned? Um, we all know we get various infections and exposed to various infections, and SARS-CoV-2 has now taught us that. But influenza, various types of mycoplasma, Babesia, Bartonella, Lyme, uh, even fungal infections. And our body um, normally produces antibodies that recognize these infectious agents. And that's an important part of our immune system. Uh, it also is involved in cancer, but uh, we won't talk about that today. But interestingly, uh, autoimmune antibodies with the target the brain have been associated in the past with neoplasms. So these antibodies in a certain individual which are made, happen to be made against specific targets, we call them epitopes, I'll talk about that briefly in a minute, through a process called molecular mimicry. And in identifying and binding to and making antibodies directed against those epitopes, there is a uh, another epitope that's also found in a part of the body, and in this case, it's the brain. And so as it crosses the blood-brain barrier in a process we think of as friendly fire in the wartime, you see these various types of symptoms that uh, are a result of the interference between the neurologic transmission in the brain. And these result in these various types of symptoms. The challenge is the heterogeneity of these symptoms because often we, we kind of tie things into, you have one specific symptom or two and tie it to another type of underlying etiology. The challenge is, is these are complex. And the reason these are complex is because it impacts different parts of the brain and the nervous system. And as I mentioned, uh, symptomatic treatment is the standard of care. But in these patients, uh, the symptomatic treatment often actually can exacerbate it or uh, in some times um, they aren't very, in most times not effective because it's an underlying immunological dysfunction. One thing that we do know is SARS-CoV-2, uh, because of the number of patients that have been infected and the prevalence of the dis disease, is that we see long COVID. And long COVID is now known to be an autoimmune uh, response or an immune dysfunction that's triggered by uh, the, the virus or the spike protein uh, with common epitopes. And so publications such as in The Lancet has shown that about one in three COVID patients 
uh, are diagnosed with some type of neuropsychiatric condition in the following six months. This is uh, over almost a quarter of a million individuals that were followed in a retrospective study. So let's move to molecular mimicry. So molecular mimicry is a biological mechanism and how infections can trigger autoimmune dysfunction that result in these neurologic and psychiatric and behavioral disorders. And then the question of why certain infections are more common uh, with PANDAS and PANS or neurologic Lyme or long COVID. So first let's talk about molecular mimicry. It's, it's a term that's been around uh, for a long time. Um, we see molecular mimicry or let's call it mimicry in nature. As you can see, um, protective mechanisms uh, that actually uh, do mimic each other in order to camouflage or actually help in its survival. But this occurs when similar sequences between foreign and cell peptide result in the activation of T or B cells. So if you think about the protein letter alphabet, there are only 20 letters that our body uses. So these 20 letters, if you think about this in the alphabet, at some point, a particular string of letters are gonna be identical in an organism and in some target in our body. So if you look at these sequence series in these particular comparisons, um, there's a string of sequences that are identical or very similar to each other. And that's normal. Our, our immune system um, through tolerance, self uh, tolerance is, is, is uh, works to rid our body of those antibodies and B cells and T cells that identified as self-reactive and it's done through a process that I won't go through, but through the thymus, through the lymph nodes, through various types of deletion mechanisms to get rid of them. Um, this is a practical illustration of molecular mimicry. If you kind of look at this as one of the twins said, you don't get lunch, mom thought I was you and fed, fed me twice. Uh, the idea is that this identification um, or misclassification impacts uh, something, and uh, in this case, it's lunch. But in other cases, as I'm going to show you here, uh, let's take, for instance, a bacteria like streptococcal bacteria. Um, these protein letter alphabets are uh, present on that. Our body will make uh, antibodies directed against various what we call epitopes. And you probably heard it through the vaccinations and SARS-CoV-2 that they're looking for the ability to generate neutralizing antibodies. So antibodies can be made against a whole host of different targets within an organism. And in the cases where it's against, let's call it this specific epitope, um, that's an important piece, but there are many different epitopes that it will make. Then the body will generate B cells that will continue to turn into plasma cells, will alert the T cells, and then you will develop these long-term, over time, memory B cells. And these memory B cells are the ones that you want, in like which is vaccination is for, uh, so that if we ever see any of these uh, real agents in the future, that our body has already made the uh, antibodies and ready to be able to produce them rather than waiting three to four weeks. But what happens if that epitope is very similar to let's say the part of a neuron or part of a basal ganglia in the brain and those sequence of letters are identical? Well, obviously once that antibody is made, uh, it will cross react thinking that it does see an identical uh, part, which is a part that is actually a part of our body. And we see this in many other conditions like diabetes type 1, Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, uh, various types of other conditions that have been described through molecular mimicry, including narcolepsy, uh, and also now uh, Epstein-Barr virus and MS. So this is the process we call molecular mimicry. And if you can think about it as friendly fire, uh, I'm not sure where that term came from, but it's where our strongest forces since our immune system is directed against ourself. And uh, interesting what you find in uh, these patients that do have uh, these uh, infection triggered autoimmune neuropsychiatric condition is uh, there is generally a family history 
uh, of not psychiatric illnesses or things like that, but autoimmune dysfunction. Uh, it could be something as simple as psoriasis or asthma, could be things like lupus, MS, other types of indications that there is a predisposition to a dysfunction of self, non-self dysregulation. On the genetic side, uh, we also know that there are major histocompatibility complexes are involved in certain HLA types. We won't go into that today, um, but this is, this is tied in directly to the genetic um, susceptibility. So what about strep and molecular mimicry? So we know that PANDAS, uh, the S stands for strep, um, pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with a strep infection. Here's the strep bacteria. Here's the cell wall. What uh, it's been determined is that the group A carbohydrate and the M protein in the group A beta hemolytic streptococcal cell wall uh, has a common sequence homology uh, to targets in heart valves. Hence, we see uh, strep-induced rheumatic fever uh, and uh, the treatment is penicillin. Uh, but also within patients that get rheumatic fever, we see uh, what's called Sydenham chorea. Sydenham chorea is the cross-reactive targets that are targeted in the basal ganglia. And we'll talk a little bit more about the basal ganglia and its normal functions and how that's involved. But also you see there's targets that are also similar that cause arthralgia in the joints uh, and also some kidney dysfunction. Um, interestingly, and this is where the Lyme uh, bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi comes in, uh, it's been uh, identified that again, the strep protein M protein has a sequence homology to the outer surface protein of Borrelia burgdorferi, surface protein A. So you can see that if um, the commonality and the epitopes that are made here are also very similar and are made here, uh, that you can see very similar symptoms. And hence there, there is, so you see post-treatment Lyme disease, you see patients that have arthralgia, you see them also with the neuropsychiatric uh, components and other types of disorders, or I should say symptoms that occur. And uh, these publications have identified that there are cross-reactive um, strep pyogenes M protein, both which share sequence homology to Borrelia burgdorferi, outer surface protein A, suggest a role for molecular mimicry in the generation of these uh, auto uh, antibody reactivities. So again, uh, patients that have um, chronic Lyme or neurologic Lyme or post-treatment Lyme, uh, aside from the other issue that Lyme is also, uh, the spirochete is also intracellular um, bacterium, spirochete, is very difficult to also diagnose that patients with long-term Lyme or Lyme um, um, conditions like neurologic Lyme suffer for quite a long time. So let's go back to uh, the association with streptococcal infections and OCD and ticks and brain uh, inflammation. Um, what you can see from this publication is that patients in the caudate putamen and globus pallidus, which is part of the basal ganglia, but not in the thalamus, which is not part of the basal ganglia, are uh, overall uh, enlarged in uh, children that have OCD and ticks, post-streptococcal infection. So the basal ganglia, what's it responsible for? Well, it's responsible for voluntary motor movement procedural learning, cognitive functions, emotional functions, uh, and eye movement. So you can see the commonality, um, motor tics, voluntary motor movement control, procedural learning here, if it interferes with that, cognitive dysfunctions, maybe uh, learning behaviors, emotional functions, you can see uh, anxiety, other types of uh, uh, conditions that go, eye movement, um, dilated pupils, um, you can see the direct connection with the functions of the basal ganglia and when a target or an antibody might interfere with the normal functions within that particular part of the brain. So the nomenclature can be confusing, um, but the question is, these conditions and mechanisms limited to pans and pans? And we believe the answer is no, but it's a very good model for all these other conditions. PANDAS, as was described by Dr. Susan Sweeto, uh, was associated with a streptococcal infection and patients that 
uh, also exhibited these uh, different types of sy symptoms post-treptococcal infection. But she did also say that many of the other patients had other conditions or other infections. So this is where the other microbes can come in, Lyme, mycoplasma, Babesia, Bartonella, and it's also believed that other environmental factors or biological factors and potentially uh, things like mold uh, and other things that might be uh, impacting this. So you can classify them into both infectious triggers and uh, non-infectious triggers. And this is where the term PANS came from, which is a uh, collection of syndromes. Uh, but again, the reference is to pediatric and acute onset uh, in reference of this. There are other groups who have identified other terms. I won't go into all of them, but this one, ANDL, Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with Lyme. Uh, Dr. Amram Katz has uh, described this and tested hundreds of patients uh, with a panel and also treated them effectively. Um, sometimes he called this adult neuropsychiatric disorder associated with Lyme. The terminology of basal ganglia encephalitis or autoimmune encephalopathy secondary infection is an attempt to identify the broader overall condition that doesn't limit it to uh, pediatrics because adults do, uh, we see adults with this condition or children grow up to be adults. And then also a sudden onset, although it's a criteria for pans and pandas, sometimes this acuity of onset might be more gradual in certain people, um, in which this case, these are uh, encompassed within these conditions. Um, there is some nomenclature, the terminology, sometimes uh, there's a denotation, there's a connotation. Uh, the connotation is encephalitis is a direct uh, infectious tr target of the brain, but the, the denotation, the strict denotation is encephalitis is just an uh, inflammation of the brain, which is why they're using basal ganglia encephalitis, encephalopathy being a disorder of the brain. So um, interestingly, none of this is new. Uh, rheumatic fever has been known since the 1800s and even Sydenham, Korea, um, back into the 1600s, where group A strep uh, through molecular mimicry uh, begins to develop antibodies that target the heart, which results in rheumatic fever, uh, but also has the ability to target the brain, in particular the basal ganglia, and result in what's known as Sydenham Korea. Uh, it also used to be known as St. Vitus's Dance, where these uh, children had uncontrollable movements or Koreaform movements, loss of motor control, and loss of emotional control. So what infections are typically associated with these autoimmune encephalopathies? And this has to go back to with the commonalities of these epitopes. We see frequently group A strep, uh, also some influenza A, uh, chickenpox, varicella, mycoplasma, Lyme, as I mentioned with Borrelia, uh, Babesia, Bartonella, Coxsackie virus, and others. Um, and the reason being is there are common epitopes with these and common targets that if their resulting antibodies are directed against these particular epitopes, they will cross-react with other parts of the brain and central nervous system. So the burden of the financial impact on parents, and if you're a parent there, you very much uh, understand and relate to this. We've done a survey, which we're working uh, on a manuscript of over a thousand parents with pandas and pans patients. And one of the questions, there is a small write-in, they uh, wrote in these answers. What was the financial impact? You can see here, credit card debt, broke, skip bills, strained savings, lose jobs, sold house. Overall, what we found after testing over 14,000 patients uh, in our clinical laboratory, that they have seen between five and 15 doctors before they come to us and have a proper diagnosis. And again, this has to do uh, with um, the complexity of the disorder and the length of time from symptom onset to diagnosis is about three to five years with about another three to 18 months before receiving proper treatment. Our goal is to help accelerate the diagnosis to the treatment time so that patients don't have to suffer all of these 
um, years prior to getting adequate diagnosis and treatment. But we see amazing patient recoveries when they're properly diagnosed and treated. You can go to our website and look at Grace's video. These are one of hundreds of patients who have come to us and told us their story. She was diagnosed with a mental disorder at eight. This is her mother's picture of her trying to kill herself. They emptied their 401k twice and uh, we were able to test her. Her treatment was changed. And recently uh, she sent us this picture now, her grown up. Uh, completely well, back to normal life, and on the cheer team. And there are many, many, many more stories like that. So how do the biological targets in the Cunningham panel uh, help diagnose and direct therapy with these immune-mediated neuropsychiatric disorders? So this is what the results would look, look like if a patient is tested. And it's the basis of 20 years of Sydenham career research that led to identifying these targets. And I uh, uh, named the panel after my co-founder, Dr. Madeline Cunningham, because of all the research that she has done. Um, these include the two dopamine receptors as targets, and you can see that they uh, result in various symptoms, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Lysogangliocide, which is a myelin sheath, and I'll talk a bit more about that. The tubulin, which is also a structural protein in the brain cells. And then this particular calmodulin chamkinase activity that's also involved in upregulating neurotransmitters in the brain. Um, so what you can see is if these antibodies interfere with these pre and post uh, synaptic targets in the brain, they will interfere with uh, dopaminergic signaling and other parts of neurotransmission back and forth through these neurons in the basal ganglia. And again, remembering the basal ganglia is responsible for those two specific types of um, uh, biological functions. What I want to emphasize is this panel is an aid in a physician's diagnosis of an autoimmune encephalopathy like PANDAS PANS. It's not a diagnostic because the diagnosis of PANDAS and PANS is a clinical diagnosis. It's not a biological diagnosis today. And so remembering it's an aid for a physician uh, to understand if the root and the etiological root may be autoimmune. And that's what's important because these antibodies we see present in other conditions that are autoimmune encephalopathies, but it is an aid, and, and that's an important aspect that I, I want to emphasize. So I'll just show a couple of case studies. We have hundreds of these. This is a 24-year-old young man who started uh, developing OCD and tics. He lost 30 pounds. He couldn't concentrate uh, emotional ability. And again, the weight loss uh, in these patients uh, tend to be OCD related, fear of food contamination, choking, et cetera. Uh, this is the reason we run all five tests is because his CAM kinase was elevated. Uh, he was treated with IVIG and plasmapheresis and all the symptoms were reduced and gone and all his antibodies went back into the normal range. This was a nine-year-old girl who developed OCD and verbal stimming and tics, uh, an autistic-like behavior, a whole host of symptoms, couldn't concentrate, emotional ability, uh, urinary uh, problems and sleep disturbances, dysgraphia, inability to draw and write, and relapsing, remitting. Two of her antibodies were positive. Again, it's the reason we do this. Our advice is, is, is at that point is to also look for these common subclinical infections because patients tend to have more than one infection. <clears throat> she had indeed had a strep infection that they didn't found. Uh, the patient was treated with azithromycin, rapid improvement, all her symptoms, all her antibodies went back to normal. So let me really quickly kind of go over these uh, receptors and what their biological function is and how these antibodies interfere with them. So for the D1, and the, uh, we, we specifically see more of these psychiatric symptoms, uh, mood instability, anxiety, irritability when they're positive. There are other symptoms that we see too, but principally we, we see them surrounding these psychiatric symptoms. When D2 is positive, we tend to see more movement-associated symptoms, career form movements, hyperactivity, and others. Uh, and so those are listed in the report and on, on our website. Um, symptom correlation with autoantibodies against tubulin, which is an intracellular 
uh, structural protein of brain cells. It's in many cells, but it's very, very highly concentrated in brain cells. And we see typically the OCD or the brain fog, uh, concentration difficulties, and uh, many of these others, as you can see here. For the lysoganglia side, when we see antibodies against lysoganglia side GM1, it's the myelin sheath around the nerve cells. We tend to see more of the ticks uh, and even joint and connective tissue pain uh, and sleep disturbances, as you can see here. And so we get to the CAM kinase, which is a more complex assay that we grow human neuronal cells in culture and incubate the serum on it, pulse chase them with P32, is that this uh, particular enzyme is associated with the sympathetic nervous system activation. Uh, we see fight or flight behavior, separation anxiety, um, but also what we tend to find is there, there is an association with the presence of either a subclinical, an active, or a recurrent infection, which uh, may not be symptomatic. So one thing about the CAM kinase, which is a unique assay that we run and is a very complex one, is that the emerging role is being understood in neuropsychiatric disease. It's had a recent series uh, suggests that CAM K2 dysfunction throughout the brain may underline a myriad of neuropsychiatric disorders, including drug addiction, schizophrenia, depression, epilepsy, and multiple neurodevelopmental disorders, disorders, perhaps through maladaption in the glutamate signaling and neuroplasticity. So CAM kinase is involved in many of these other activation of these receptors, and we're still studying the research on how this uh, function occurs to better provide ways to help a diagnose and treat patients. But these kinases look like this. So it's a complex enzyme inside a cell it's activated and uh, it phosphorylates many of the different responses and uh, it causes, it can cause uh, a dysregulation if it's activated inappropriately and is not needed. As I mentioned, um, it upregulates the synthesis of these neurotransmitters, dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. So let me briefly share with you a published study that you can see, which was done with uh, about a dozen uh, physicians, and, and actually you'll see uh, here, I don't have all the authors on there, but about a dozen different physicians were involved in helping us with their patients, pre and post treatment of uh, their symptoms, and we looked at their antibodies before and after treatment and whether or not they improved. The first thing that was important was we saw multiple infections uh, and many subclinical infections. They all met the criteria for either being diagnosed or suspected diagnosed with pandas and pans. And for those patients that improved after treatment, prior to their treatment, all of them had one or more autoantibodies of each of these different targets. The heat map demonstrates the positive, positivity and the degree of positivity. In those who improved or, or completely resolved, this is their post-treatment result. And so you can see the dramatic change in the number of positive tests after a patient improved. I, I won't take time to show the, uh, the ones who didn't, but they actually were almost opposite of this. So what we found is the accuracy of the test of identifying correlating with symptoms and post-treatment resolution was 86%. We're working now to improve the accuracy through algorithms to weight these tests differently to get up and we see we can get it up to 90%. We have through other clinicians and other studies uh, have published studies in autism, uh, Lyme disease, schizophrenia, uh, and several other conditions. And so those are available uh, at your leisure. So what we end up doing is we're looking at uh, patients that have neuropsychiatric and behavioral disorders separating them into the two categories of those who are infection-triggered autoimmune and those who are not. And we're working with an artificial intelligence group to be able to predict which treatments would be likely to be more responsive. Currently, um, patients are directed towards these treatments and with good results, but ideally it would be great to know which ones would be most effective prior to treatment. So a couple of common symptoms and the therapeutic categories that have shown clinical effectiveness in these patients. Uh, 
So uh, many of these uh, patients who have tested positive for antineuronal antibodies, we see sudden and rapid onset as with you see in pandas and pans, sudden and rapid onset of OCD, restrictive eating disorders, motor or vocal tics or creiform movements, anxiety, rage, separation, anxiety, uh, depression, developmental and behavioral regression, medriasis, the dilated pupils, urinary frequency, of course, relapsing remitting, which is a hallmark of the pandas, pans. Um, and one of our clinicians who said, if you would ask every one of these patients, they have all admitted to some suicidal ideation, which is something that's very important to recognize. Treatment resistant to standard neuropsychiatric drugs, of course, a pandas, pans diagnosis, family history of autoimmune disorders, and the frequency of infections, which can be subclinical, uh, and sometimes uh, Lyme or post-treatment Lyme disease. So we have seen clinical effectiveness over and over again when there is evidence of an autoimmune neuroinflammatory disorder. And these treatments in general follow within anti-infective categories, find the infections. Anti-inflammatory, as you saw the inflammation in that uh, in slide for the MRIs, immune modulators if necessary in order to uh, deal with the immune dysregulation, and then of course temporary symptomatic treatment as needed. Um, and these can be various categories, antimicrobials, anti-inflammatories. Uh, we're doing some studies with plasmapheresis, IVIG also, and rituximab. We're looking at pre and post testing with some clinicians, and then other symptomatic treatment to manage the patient's symptoms. For those that you want more detailed guidelines, you can download through the PANDAS Physician Network and uh, others is the uh, JCAP treatment guidelines um, and they're available, but it kind of a brief overview here is <clears throat> make sure you rule out any other causes, establish a correct diagnosis, identify and treat all the infections. Again, many of these are subclinical and we find multiple infections. Um, so the idea is kind of if you're sitting on two thumbtacks, removing one thumbtack doesn't remove 50% of the symptoms. So you have to treat all the infections because you're stimulating the immune system. Um, the other is then treat any kind of inflammation because the inflammatory pathway, which develops and creates a cytokine and targeting and the other anti antibodies, then if necessary, treat any of the immune dysregulation and then, of course, provide symptomatic treatment. So kind of in summary here, there's this emergence of this complex interconnection between various infectious agents. And again, I mentioned SARS-CoV-2 is helping us understand that. Uh, and then this connection between the immune system, these autoimmune antibodies, inflammation, microglia activation, cytokines, mast cell activation, and then the functions within the brain all tied together in this genetic susceptibility and predisposition. And so Patients may feel this way when dealing with these autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders. As you can see, hey, your lab results look great. Everything's normal. You're the perfect picture of health. Uh, and in many cases, they know that that's not the case. So um, is this the tip of the iceberg? Uh, pandas and pans, it may be. Uh, neurologic Lyme, chronic uh, fatigue, uh, ME, CSF, uh, things that we see like long COVID, other things. And the brain is the last frontier in medicine. Um, if you would like any uh, references, there are some good references. Uh, Dr. Kaplan, Dr. Bach, Dr. Kindler have some uh, Lyme and then also brain inflammation and why you are still sick, uh, written by uh, Beth Maloney, some parent books on pandas and pans, uh, even one for kids uh, from Melanie Weiss. Uh, brain on fire, which is the NMDA receptor encephalitis, which is another target in the brain. Uh, and then um, a DVD uh, that was filmed by Tim Sorrell, chronicling the lives of three or four uh, parents and patients of pandas and pants. So with that, um, I want to thank you for your time and attention. Uh, we have multiple resources at our website on molecular labs. Uh, and thank you to the clinicians who are on this webinar for the work you're doing at the front line. Um, also, uh, if you would like to uh, any other information, just email me. What we're looking for is clinicians who would like to work with us in some studies.
if they have patients that they have been working with, had a test prior to uh, that that uh, identified, we would like to work with you and provide a post-treatment test uh, to be able to document uh, patients' improvement and getting well and publish a clinical case study. And then thank you to Gabriella and Aspire for all that she's doing to help uh, educate and inform the public. Uh, and uh, that will conclude um, my talk today, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. It was so informative and jam-packed with a lot of information. I know people are going to want to go back and, and re-listen to parts um, and look at those, some of the details on the slides more carefully. I know I will. Um, we did get some questions ahead of time, um, and we will look at the questions that may have come into the chat. I haven't really taken a look at those. Um, but just as a note that um, Craig is not able to answer direct medical questions. Um, and, and so if there's come up, I'm either gonna reword them to try to make them less direct or pass over them. Um, so I'm just gonna go through some of the ones that we got in. Um, so when you're a patient or a provider and you're looking at whether or not to do the Cunningham panel, what is the best timing of it? Like I've heard it mentioned many times, like the height of the flare, but it, can you still do it like before you really treat it or what are your thoughts on the timing? As far as testing? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we do. All, so this is a metabolic test and uh, we're actually sampling to see at the present time of that patient, uh, is there any of uh, these antibodies and serum? So, you know, metabolic tests, things change over time. Ideally, it is good uh, if a patient has these symptoms and maybe even if flares are symptomatic. So that's an important piece. And yes, it, it is a good time to do that, obviously, if you can get a sample. So that is important. Okay. Um, and you mentioned um, in some of the case studies that plasmapheresis and or IVIG helped lower some of those numbers. Have you seen a lowering in the numbers with antibiotics alone? Um, yes, yeah, so you remember in that other case study where the patient uh, had a actually a subclinical, I believe it was a strep infection, uh, that it was uh, just the antibiotic that actually um, removed the source of that stimulus for these autoantibodies, and she returned back to baseline. And so uh, the key there is early detection, because as you know that over time, the body will make memory B cells if those infections continue for a long period of time. And that's um, then what you deal with later is this, these memory B cells that are producing these long-term antibodies. So it is, uh, and it has, and we have seen that uh, treatment with uh, anti-infective specifically if caught early, um, that in many cases, we do have uh, examples of that being all that they needed. Now, because it's not always caught early, uh, it tends to be a little more infrequent than what we typically see. Right. But that is a definitely a good case for, you know, we always say early treatment leads to better outcomes. And that's sort of an example of why, um, an, an exa explanation. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned piggybacking on that question that the cam kinase, um, excuse me if I get this wrong, <laughs> um, you can see uh, it can be elevated, it suggests an active infection. So in those cases, if they're even small that your pool is of them that are treated with infection, uh, you know, just an antibacterial, do you find that the cam kinase is what's lowered more significantly than some of the others, or do you see a lowering across the board? So we do see a, a lowering across the board when that's the case. The cam kinase seems to be tending to indicate that there is an active or a reactive infection. It is not necessarily a diagnostic for an infection, but because of the acuity of that, and we don't understand completely what the biology is, that it seems to be active in those early stages of infection. It tends to then wane over time and the other antibodies tend to come up. Um, so the goal overall is to bring back to baseline all of them. And that way we see that that's correlated with symptom resolution. 
Um, but in particular, it, it does seem to, when a patient is doing well and recovering and symptom treatments are effective, all of them go back and tend to go back into baseline. And then you mentioned something about CAM kinase um, and glutamate signaling may be linked. Um, we think that may be an indication for possible treatment strategies by trying to manage the glutamate levels sort of on the back end. Yeah, so, you know, this is a kind of a complex intersection. You kind of think about the LA freeways. Um, there's a lot of interconnectivity to this and the CAM kinase, as well as many of these other targets, but the CAM kinase in particular, um, seems to be involved with uh, some way with the NMDI receptor, the glutamate components, other receptors. So uh, yes, we believe that there's probably some treatment modalities that can influence that. Um, there was a paper that was published recently by Dr. Kiki Chang showing that in a genetically, um, it was actually a genetic mutation in the CAM, a patient had a constitutively on enzyme that resulted in intellectual disability that the treatments that helped regulate the CAM actually improved the patient's symptoms. Now, again, that's a symptomatic treatment for a genetic mutation what we want to do is remove the real source for these infection-triggered autoimmune conditions on the CAM. But it is a correlation showing that, yes, there are other, other treatments that can be uh, helpful when dealing with these uh, types of results. So backing up to that question is, would a glutamate med, for example, do you think, do you know anything about memantonine help or hurt that glutamate issue? I don't know. That, that one I'm not uh, able to answer because again, some of the early research on the connectivity to it, we do know that the CAM is also involved in um, uh, various types of receptors as you saw, but uh, even um, uh, things that we were trying to figure out as to how that um, impacts other things like the mTOR pathway is also one of them. Um, but right now, the, uh, I, I, we don't know the answer to that. Okay. Uh, and then what is the difference between the Cunningham panel and the neural zoomer plus? Do you know anything about that test? Um, a little bit. Uh, I, we don't see a lot of published data on that, um, but the, it seems to be more of, uh, a, a, I think there's maybe, a, there's some different targets and the way in which they assay them are different. Uh, I would say that um, anything that may be effective in helping to identify whether there is an autoimmune condition, an underlying one, now, because um, I don't believe that test, well, I know they don't use cam, uh, cam kinase uh, testing and some of the other targets that uh, you're looking at whether or not you're going to cover all of the bases for that. So, um, but I haven't seen much research published on that. So I can't comment much on, on that. Um, what are your thoughts on retesting? Do you think it's something that should be done periodically. I mean, I know there's an expense attached to it, so everybody's always sort of trying to be cognizant of that, but, um, you know, there's one specific question in here. Um, he, a 22-year-old had elevated cam kinase and antitubulin in 2019. Um, would it, do you, what do you think about retesting? I don't know what treatment they've done or anything like that. So, yeah, so. yeah, we do. Um... The basis of the test is is uh, almost a thousand dollars. The people to know that uh, it also doesn't cover all of our costs. So I go out and raise capital through uh, other investors and people to keep doing our work. We do bill for insurance, and we also do have payment plans to to help. Um, as far as the retesting, we do find that many clinicians do find it very helpful to see if the patient is responding well to the treatments and to continue, or if there's still underlying things like the CAM activation that they, they indicates to them there's still an underlying infection. Um, often what we do also is to see that um, physicians test if they wanna see if that treatment modality is working um, what we're encouraging, and as I mentioned, that if the other clinicians want to, to contact me, um, we want to publish some studies showing post-treatment when patients are well. Um, clearly, 
if you don't need to, to, to take a test in your well, you don't need to do that. Uh, but for the benefit of other clinicians who would like to know what the treatment uh, regimen was and the fact that these antibodies were present and absent, um, we would encourage you to contact us and we'll help by providing um, some, some help with that post-treatment testing. So the answer is, in cases where that's helpful, we do find patients and physicians opting to do that. Um. No, we talked a little bit about that timing and the active infection, but what if you had a family that their onset of symptoms is, you know, many years ago, like over a decade ago, um, and they've just continued to have chronic issues, but they've never had a diagnosis of PAMS and never been treated um, because they've just learned about it. Um, do you think that doing the this panel would still be appropriate? Well, yes, and those are the cases we find the most helpful is because uh, where patients have maybe been suffering for decades and been trying various treatments, um, getting to the underlying root and then directing treatments toward the root has been most helpful. The good news is that there are both studies and publications and what we see in practicality is that when the root is identified and treated, even after in some cases, many, many years of suffering, patients make some remarkable and amazing recoveries. And, and one of the things we believe is the case is this is a B cell mediated autoimmune condition versus a T cell principally mediated condition. T cells typically are, uh, they, they're, they're, they're tissue tropic, they kill cells. Um, so there's the degradation of this, whereas in the B cells tend to be more interfering um, and patients tend to recover. So this is the good news about that. We do see patients who have uh, had these symptoms for many, many, many years and have been properly diagnosed and treated, and they do make some amazing recoveries when treating the root. And therefore, it's important to make sure you, you've identified the root, which is why testing can be important in those cases. So on that, um, with the T cell, B cell, is that why possibly why we don't see, I you know imaging tests are um, always not the best for PANS because it's hard to see that inflammation, but we um, tend so far don't see a lot of um, tissue damage in the basal ganglia after years of um, living with this disorder? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know what the answer is to that, but it certainly could contribute to that. The inflammation part is because, you know, to be able to quantitatively do that and measure pre and post patient versus size difference for many others, it, it requires a lot of data. But uh, I think Dr. Frankovich and others have been doing some really amazing imaging studies that are being published to show that as to whether or not the tissue damage is the case. Uh, it certainly could be because you don't, don't tend to see that long-term tissue destruction as you would, let's say, in diabetes type one or other types of things like uh, MS or lupus or things uh, which may tend to be more T cell mediated. Um, T cells and B cells are interacting with each other constantly, but the causative agent uh, may tend to be more the B cells. So is that, so since the B cells are those memory cells, is that one of the reasons why, or is it something else that once the sort of the proverbial ball gets rolling of that inflammation and of that constant overreaction um, because of their B cells that the memory just hasn't turned off or how does it, I think I'm confused. <laughs> yeah, so of course, immunology is uh, always being, uh, defined as we speak. Uh, when I was in uh, Genentech in 83 and HIV came along, we, we didn't even know what a, T a CD4 T cell was. Uh, and, and now, so the answer uh, to that is uh, B cells, uh, we do know, uh, obviously create memory B cells so that they're lasting memory so that they can uh, quickly replicate, clonally expand, and then produce antibodies quickly through plasma cells. Um, if a patient is quiescent and then maybe have another infection reactivated, sometimes you will see uh, a very rapid trigger response, meaning that they probably have B cell, memory B cells that are still there that are activated. 
And so you can see this. This is part of the reason why rituximab actually does work in these severe cases is because if you know the function and the way rituximab works, it's a monoclonal antibody that identifies certain subset of B cells and basically destroys them all. And so therefore then the bone marrow produces new B cells and they mature without having that memory of there. Uh, so that's one of the reasons it tends to be effective in that case. But yes, um, this is other reason why it might take longer and it typically does for patients to recover who have been dealing with this uh, infection triggered autoimmunity over a long period of time, because the immune system is constantly being strengthened through these subclinical infections that may still exist. We don't know everything about how IVIG works, but um, what are your thoughts on why IVIG may cause exacerbations of symptoms of sort of flare ups? Oh, yeah. So this is related to actually sometimes flaring or worsening versus actually improving. IVIG has been demonstrated in, in certain studies and, and practical aspects um, to improve patients. And that mechanism is not quite understood, but it could be like feedback inhibition or what's called anti-idiotype antibodies, but it does show a nonspecific effectiveness. Sometimes patients may tend to have a flare and it may be temporary. Um, there are some things that we find, and that's something that we're still looking into because uh, IVIG is collected from thousands of patients. Um, we do find on occasion um, that some of these lots and preparations may have these exogenous autoimmune antibodies present in them. And um, they're exogenous, meaning they're not replicating internally. So once they're cleared, the rest of the uh, preparation it, it takes effect and is effective. Um, but but um, I, I don't know many, but I'm, I've heard that on occasion, some people can have initial flares, but over time, um, the, those treatments tend to be uh, effective over time. Okay, um, this question just came into the chat. If I ask my son's doctor to test for B cells, um, what am I asking for? Can, can it be tested for B cells? Um, certainly you can. I, I, don't, I don't think that that's really, again, I'm going to defer to the clinicians, but um, uh, what we're really looking for is the presence of whether or not these autoimmune antibodies are present in the serum um, because we all have B cells and we need the B cells and the B cells produce um, everything from uh, any of the vaccines that we've had, plus any of the past infections, including rhinovirus and the cold and all of that and influenza. Um, so testing for B cells per se aren't, isn't, at least in, you know, my, my initial opinion here is, is at least for this particular component is not, not necessarily something that would be uh, uh, an advantage, uh, but we're looking here in this case for are there specific targeted antineuronal antibodies that are directed against brain targets in the serum at the time of the blood draw? Okay. Um, so we about another timing question. If you were um, going to run the panel, would it be better to, and you knew you were going to probably start antibiotics say soon or later, is it better to do the panel before you start antibiotics? And if you can't, you get, get them in right away, is it still worth doing the test during that flare? Yes, yes. And, and of course, you want confirmation that this is the correct route that you're treating. Uh, and, and certainly there are good clinicians who have seen so many of them that they that they look uh, through the history and physical and all the other things and, and uh, make that determination and treat. Again, this is an aid to a physician's diagnosis. So it, it is, it is uh, helpful to have a test uh, prior to treatment. And even if they have started on antibiotics to um, uh, have a test to be sure to con confirm if uh, this is immune mediated. Now, uh, dealing with the infection is the first important step and infections, I would say. But if a patient still doesn't completely return to baseline, uh, you know that you're still dealing with an immune-mediated component. You deal with the inflammation and then also the uh, immune, immune dysregulation. 
Uh, the one thing I might add is there are certain treatments that will interfere or have the potential to interfere with testing. And those are those that actually suppress the immune system. So for instance, um, um, steroids, which will suppress the immune system, which is why it tends to be effective because you're suppressing the uh, B cell production of these antibodies. Um, if we take a serum sample at maybe uh, the height of that, um, we might not see, we still can, and this is the physician's discretion, we still, we may not see the full effect of those antibodies. The other is IVIG. If they're on IVIG and it hasn't completely cleared, um, we're all, it's also doing something to regulate the immune system. So again, remembering we're trying to measure is there present autoimmune antibodies that the patient is producing at the time. So those two uh, typically tend to be those that have the potential to interfere, um, but we do see that sometimes we can still pick up these things uh, in spite of that. Let me, let me clarify, Dr. David Traver, who does a lot of testing and treatment for patients, mentioned that azithromycin can be a targeted treatment, which also, he, in his experience, he can see interferes. So that's something from a clinician standpoint, I, I would point out. Uh, and he has a lot of uh, direct practice with that. And then you, back in the slides, you were talking about all the neuropsychiatric disorders that are clinically uh, diagnosed. And so we know with PAMS, we often um, get a lot of pushback on that clinical diagnosis because it is infectious, often infectious related. Um, what would be your response to um, if someone says, oh no, you have to have, you know, a positive strep test or something like that um, based oh. on? Oh, um, as far as strep, you know, this is part of the reason that I think people think that there's a controversy because strep, well, 98% uh, of the people get strep, but 98% of the people don't have pandas, okay? Um, remembering pans and pandas is only, pans is, pandas refers to strep and pediatric, but there are many other infectious agents that do uh, do that. The other is the, the strep in those cases may be gone, but the immune system may have been generating antibodies to it. This is the important reason why we do the testing is because it's not necessarily to determine that you have strep or don't have strep. And by the way, strep can be in any orifice of the body too. It doesn't necessarily be um, in, in the oral pharynx. Uh, so this is the reason why you want to find out, are there the resulting autoimmune antibodies that are present? Because that's what you're treating. You're treating this immune dysregulation that results in these autoantibodies. Um, I, I can also make the argument that uh, smoking doesn't cause lung cancer. So if you didn't know that only 15% of the people who smoke their entire life get lung cancer, you might think, well, smoking doesn't cause lung cancer. But 98% um, uh, of the people who get lung cancer are smokers, okay? But if you only knew that 15% of people who smoke their entire life will get lung cancer, you might think, well, lung cancer, I don't mean smoking doesn't cause lung cancer. But it's in the context of the genetic susceptibility. So if you have genes that don't metabolize carcinogens very well, don't stop your cell cycle control, uh, hormone metabolism, various other things, um, and then you have these insults. Um, th this is part of um, what you see in this complex, these complex disorders. Okay. Um, and I think to wrap up some of the questions, because a lot of them were answered during the course of the talk um, or in the course of the question and answers, what are the next steps for Moleculera? Um, Absolutely, that's uh, first, first of all, we're uh, working on trying to find um, investors who will help us as we grow. We also are uh, partnered with a, an artificial intelligence company um, to take the 14,000 patient specimens we have and help us develop treatment predictive algorithms to predict treatment efficacy. The other is we're looking also for targets for blood brain barrier that might be a better, a helpful indicator to know what the severity of these conditions are because we measure serum autoantibodies. Um, Dr. Madeline Cunningham in her research group has also measured C, uh, uh, central uh, uh, spinal fluid uh, antibodies and you see that it crosses the blood brain barrier. But if the blood brain barrier is, is not, um, is intact, 
then it may be more predisposition, or you might see that it may be the effects are less. Um, the third thing that we're working on is um, there are also cardiovascular components that are autoimmune infection triggered related, such as myocarditis, atrial fibrillation, cardiomyopathy, and heart, heart failure. And portions of those have been identified as having an infectious trigger that if you treat the infection in the immune system, those patients with those diagnoses also improve. So our goal is to also bring those through clinical studies and validation, as well as I'd like to see us be able to have a point of care screening test that will be inexpensive that a doctor could use and rule in or rule out autoimmunity at the time a patient presents, reflex test back to the lab for the treatment algorithm and all the, all the antibodies and catch the patient very, very early. Um, and then we have some ideas for therapeutics that target these. Um, so we don't lack for uh, things to do, but we're, we're looking for resources to be able to help us and uh, certainly help so we can help um, the doctors that are at the front line taking care of these patients. Yeah, resources, they're always at a premium, right? Um, and at a minimum. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. It was very informative and um, I will work on just doing the quick edits, putting the slides up for the questions and getting it um, up on our YouTube channel and linked through our original um, page on our Aspire website that people registered through um, so that the audience here can rewatch and share. Um, we definitely want you to share. Um, as much as you can, because that is one of the best ways to um, get the word out about Pam's Pandas and um, the Cunningham panel. Um, thank you so much for your time. And uh, hello to Amy, who I see has come in. She does a wonderful job of mm -hmm. managing clients and customers, I mean, patients and answering questions. She's really a wonderful resource and our community is much better for her in it too. And she helped me um, get the information they needed from you. So I always appreciate that. And it's always a joy to work with both of you. So um, have a wonderful Pans Pans Awareness Day. Uh, share, 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 talk, talk, talk. It's just everybody um, hone in their two minute elevator pitch about what Pans is and talk about how it affected your family because our power is really in our stories a lot of our times um you know it's what we can do sort of as lay people and on the ground or even as providers saying you know i had these patients and this happened and that happened and then we did this and mm -hmm. got better so um you know we're sort of all in it together so i really appreciate um speakers like you taking your time to um work on your lecture and answer all the questions and be here with us today and for all the people who um sit here and listen and attend and ask wonderful questions. So we couldn't do it without all of you. So thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful day and stay healthy. <laughs> thank you, Gabriella. Yes, appreciate all your hard work too and all the patients and the physicians who are listening. All right, appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Uh,